Hi there, everybody. Hope you're having a great Friday. I'm very excited. Today, we're gonna to be talking all things pelvic floor with Dr. Allison Chikande of Pelvic Rehabilitation. And it's so interesting because there are so many patients of mine, uh, patients of my colleagues that really just say, hey, you know, I, I didn't even know this existed. I didn't even know that I can actually go to someone and deal with some of the pelvic pain I had or the fact that I've had incontinence or I'm having some issues having sex, it's really painful. Um, they just think that they have to grin and bear it or that there's not actually something that they can, someone they can see, but also a therapist that they can see that will actually help them on that road to recovery. So it's really interesting to hear from our patients how wonderful um, their experience has been. And as most patients want, they want a definitely a collaborative approach. They want their doctor to be on board, they want their therapist to understand, and for everyone to really be in unison. Um, and in generally, generally speaking, we want to try to burst some myths today a little bit and um, help uh, with some of your burning questions and help everyone um, get a little bit more support for pelvic pain. And we have Dr. Shrikande coming on right now. Hello. Thanks so much for joining. Um, I'm so excited to, to chat today as part of our Wise Intuition series. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I'm very good. How's Florida? <laughs> there you are. So we just had a little bit of... Um... <sighs> yeah, and you know, I think it's, um, you know, we've been colleagues for so long, and I love your whole team. Um, it's just such a a uh, wonderful collaborative approach. And I really wanted to kind of just hop on here because what I was just saying in the introduction was that, you know, there's so many women still out there um, that don't know that they can get care for pelvic pain, that there's such a thing as a specialty in physiatry and OBGYNs and all sorts of um, medical doctors that can help them with painful sex or uh, problems when they're pregnant or um, issues with uh, postpartum and having pelvic pain, having painful sex, all of these things we can really make such a big difference on. And, um, you know, women uh, often will come to us and say, you know, I didn't know people can kind of go in and, and, and explore the pelvic floor and do an internal exam and work with my body and get me to connect with certain new muscles. It's, it's a whole new world. And so um, I'm still, uh, you know, at this point in time, of course, for us, it's like, of course we do this, you know, of course this is, you know, something that's out there. But there are still so many people that don't know about that, right? So I just wanted um, you to introduce yourself uh, for those in the audience who may not know you um, and, uh, and, and, you know, highlight for us maybe really what the specialties are within pelvic rehab and, and you know, what the whole group, um, you know, does for this community, which I'm, I'm so thrilled uh, that you all exist and have multiple locations now. <laughs> yeah, sure. No, you're completely right. It is, a, you know, a newer, a newer field of physiatry for sure. Um, and really, we're physiatrists or rehab doctors at at pelvic rehabilitation medicine. And so we are an extension of pelvic floor physical therapy. So we're the MDDO counterpart, um, but our, I think conceptually, um, our thought processes and um, how we look at patients is, is very, very similar. Um, so that's how I would describe us. So we're the non-operative um, pelvic uh, option to treat the muscles and the nerves and the joints of the pelvis. 
And yeah. um, really yeah. what we do is we're not really trained for a specific organ system. We're really, the way we are trained is to look at the interplay between the different organ systems with each other, as well as with the nervous system and the, um, the myofascial aspect of, of their care as well. Absolutely right. And it's really, a lot of people don't realize the connection of the fascia and how it's just, I talk about it as like web, like a spider web type tissue that's superfluous throughout the rest of the body, right? So one thing connects the other and even, you know, you're doing something in your shoulder and you could affect what's happening at the bladder. I mean, you know, there's so many things and everything's so interconnected. So, you know, addressing the myofascia as well as the fascia around the organ systems is huge, you know, and um, as you know, some of us are visceral uh, mobilized, uh, um, certified in visceral mobilization. And so moving sometimes the organ system also the muscles, also the pelvis, you know, also the bones and the joints, but, you know, really addressing that as well. So I wanted to start out here with, you know, what are the most common conditions that you guys might be seeing? Um, and can you explain how maybe you take a little bit of a different spin or a little bit of um, a uniqueness to the, the approach that you have with those particular conditions um, that might be sure. at the top of your list? Yeah, definitely. So for our female patients, uh, the most common uh, different categories that we see, one would be in the gynecological realm. So a lot of endometriosis, uh, probably our most common is endometriosis. And um... sorry, you just froze there for a moment. Oh, we've lost you. It's okay. This happens. Um, we'll wait for, for, there you are. I, now we can hear sorry you. about that. My apologies. I apologize. My phone. Um, so yeah, we see, um, in the realm of gynecological endometriosis is very common. Also fibroids, um, can sometimes cause the chronic guarding of the pelvic floor, adenomyosis, or sometimes PCOS. So that would be one of our um, most common patient populations. And then we also see a lot of postpartum women after, you know, either a vaginal delivery or sometimes a C-section delivery. Um, a lot of um, uh, patients would like to assess and rehab their uh, pelvic floor muscles and nerves. And um, we also see a lot of uh, bladder pain syndrome, uh, interstitial cystitis. So I see bladder pain syndrome um, because all those different things really cause that chronic guarding of the pelvic floor musculature. Um, so we are here to really help treat the uh, muscle nerve uh, dysfunction that can come with all those different uh, processes. Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of times we have uh, – after pregnancy, one of the most common things is people feel like they can't hold their urine and they have incontinence, right? And they're told on the, you know, in the commercial that, oh, just wear this pad because it works really well. And this is completely normal. You've had one, two, three kids. Like, what do you expect? And, and when I tell my patients, no, 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 like, you're not supposed, like, you're not, this is not a death sentence. Like you don't have to be leaking urine every time you laugh or every time you do your yoga class or every time you jump uh, or lift your baby. Like this is just not, it doesn't have to happen and shouldn't actually happen. And there's ways for you to do different things to um, prevent that and to heal that, right? And so for us, it's really looking at the muscles, looking at biofeedback, watching how you're engaging your muscles. Um, and, you know, how, how do you as a non-surgical practice, um, how do you feel that you, you know, what exactly might you um, do to help someone maybe with incontinence? Um, so it really would depend if there it's if it's an urge incontinence from the hypertonic pelvic floor versus if it's um, incontinence from a hypotonic so a, a pelvic floor. So the treatment plan is yes. it would be different. Um, so classically, what we treat at PRM is the urgent. We see a lot of urge incontinence from the spastic pelvic floor, yeah. right? So what we're trying to do really with those patients is reset those short spastic weak muscles and lengthen them first so that they stop irritating the neck of the bladder, right? And, um, and then after that, yeah. we really want to get a good neuromuscular re-education program where we get those nerves talking to the, to the muscles of the pelvic floor and really help support the bladder function, right? So when they yeah. need to know how to contract and release completely so that the, the urine is controlled well and you can fully empty. 
So that's conceptually what, what we do. And if it's a hypotonic pelvic floor, it's really um, uh, would, would be physical, th pelvic floor PT, of course. And sometimes for those patients, we'll prescribe what we call um, an internal TENS unit that can really help st um, start to get that nerve muscle connection going a bit faster. Right, and getting the neural uh, sequencing back, right? And a lot of times, sometimes it's just a little late or sometimes it's hyper and then hypo. And, and so we have all these kind of- 100%. Um, yeah, and, and ultimately, you know, work, the, the, the real um, uh, key thing here, I think takeaway is that there's something to be done. And every single person's recipe is a little bit different, but there's such wide range of things that we can do to help from biofeedback, like you're talking about, from pelvic floor physical therapy, from looking at your posture, your what what how you're putting placing your body, where you're you know adjusting, and you know that that brings me to my next question is that you know a bunch of us uh, you know at Wise Body we're we're um, uh, behavioral breathing analysts, yeah, so we are. Um, going to always address the breath and the diaphragm. And what a lot of people don't know is that this is really a pressure cylinder, right? We have this whole, you know, abdomen here, and it's a pressure cylinder. We have the top is your diaphragm, your bottom is your pelvic floor, and our, all around are, you know, your abdominal muscles, your transversus, your multifidus, and all of these wonderful, um, you know, things creating really a core right? And, and your support. So when, you know, you're pregnant, it gets stretched, different things start to change. Um, postpartum as well, breastfeeding, the ligaments are loose, all of these things. But what ends up happening is that your, your diaphragm gets really kind of inactive and quite tight because now the baby has taken over so much of the space. Or you just have a breathing dysfunction. You're dealing with some anxiety, extra stress, and you just hold in your diaphragm, kind of like when people say, oh yeah, I'm always stressed out and my shoulders are up to here, right? We also have the diaphragm that actually holds and contracts. And what happens is there's an equal and opposite response in the pelvic floor. So if something's happening here and this is a cylinder, if I'm squeezing from here, what's gonna happen? Things are gonna come down the bottom. It's gonna be a lot of pressure to that bottom. And then you go in and you just do pelvic floor and you try to get it to contract again, but this guy won't let it go. And you're not getting better because no matter what you do to the pelvic floor, we actually have to just release the diaphragm and get you to breathe again. So, you know, a lot of times um, with pelvic floor, you may have taken a while to get to someone and it's been there for a really long time. And now maybe you've even developed the breathing habit against the pelvic floor issue. So it's kind of like chicken or the egg kind of stuff. You don't know whether it's that or the other, but either way, we have to address both, right? Do you help your patients with, um, you know, thinking about a breathing practice or a meditation practice or something to calm them down? Because so often we're, you know, in this kind of anxious, um, hyperreactive state almost, right? And the pelvic floor and giving us that pain. 100%, yes. I mean, we go, we go over diaphragmatic breathing, um, breathing really similar to when you were first born, you know, going back to the basics. Yeah. And a lot of times it's, you lie down and we just show you, show you how to breathe. And, and um, so it's really important. And we, we have a class that we created called Retrain Your Brain. And it's about six sessions. And within that group session, a lot of breathing techniques, muscle relaxation techniques, essentially down training um, your central nervous system, right? So yeah, that's 100% very important. Um, the mechanics are important, exactly like you said, that it's the diaphragm of, uh, really connects with the diaphragm of the pelvic floor, right? It really all has to go up and down as a nice um, uh, interplay. Uh, right. But it's also important more than the nervous system too. Right? You're resetting that vagus nerve. So it's really working at, at a higher level because conceptually what we are doing at PRM is we are treating that central sensitivity Sensitization, the peripheral sensitization and the myofascial dysfunction all at the same time because yep. I think that is the key. It's that multimodal, multidisciplinary approach um, where you all kind of need to, to, to work together and do those things those three things concomitantly. And breathing is for sure um, one of the most important things. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's um, <clears throat> oftentimes, you know, we look back 
you know, some of the stuff that is in the book, right? So we've got, you know, the, my, uh, the Wise Woman's Guide to Your Healthiest Pregnancy and Birth. And I wrote the book really because a lot of my patients were like, can you just put this down so that I can remember for my next one and so I can <laughs> share it with my friends, you know? Yeah, and and right. what, what I think, but I'm very passionate about ancient wisdom and my parents um, and my grandparents are very close to the ancient Greek culture, um, having been generations and generations uh, of on a farm in Sparta, uh, I am Spartan. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> but the ancient wisdom, there were breathing practices. I mean, a lot of people know about the yogic breathing and the asanas and, the, and all sorts of wonderful things. But literally, asana is in Greek is anasa is breath. And there's constantly, and then there's dancing, right? Moving the body with the breath. And all of these things help release your pelvic floor, activate your pelvic floor naturally while you're having fun. So there's a response to, I have no time for anything uh, in, in the book with giving you little things you can do throughout the, your day. Um, throughout, uh, you know, just sitting there, okay, I'm cooking something and I'm in my kitchen. All right, let me dance it out a little bit. And then maybe I can actually start changing my relationship with how my muscles are actually functioning, where I'm placing my body, right? I've been all day on my Zooms, you know, and my pelvic floor has gone, you know, how can I like, you know, rejuvenate, you know, and get my, also my energy going, you know, which is leads to more productivity and get you to really, you know, be, be focused and, and alive in your brain. Um, so uh, just a, a, a quick last um, question here. Um, we use real time ultrasound in our practice as biofeedback. And we um, it's something unique that we do. Um, and it literally we keep it on a superficial level and we watch how you're actually engaging certain muscles. So your transversus abdominis being super important, right? And how you engage that muscle. Like we talked about, are you doing it with the diaphragm? So can we see the sequence of events? I, I call it a symphony, yeah? So we have to have this turn on before that. And then just like you were talking about this multi-layer approach, we also have to have all the layers kind of come mm -hmm. in the right way and in the right order, right? Yeah, so, love that analogy. Yeah, and so <laughs> we want to try to make sure that we have this beautiful symphony, na, 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 not me, ma, 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 right? So we want to try to have that really beautiful thing. And a lot of times our patients are trying and they're listening right. to things and, and webinars and, and, you know, listening to something like this and trying it at home and saying, okay, let me just see if I can engage. And all of a sudden they're like, can't do it and then all of a sudden they look at the screen we show them how they've been using their pelvic floor has it actually been able and we could image even deep deep the bladder does it lift it or or have they been harping down has the strategy been poor you know what's the excitation of those muscles are they too hyper uh, uh like we talked about hypertonic or, or too spastic there and and preventing them from being able to have that fluidity you know in the body and which then leads to poor support if they don't have that fluidity, then they don't have the support. So we like to image them and give them that direct feedback. Like, yes, that's the cue. And we work on an individualized cue that works with them, that they can connect with, that every time they do their yoga class or their Pilates practice or their exercise program or their Zoom, you know, whatever, um, that they might be doing nowadays online, that they actually have their individualized cue that builds them up, that puts them right where they need to be. So the symphony is playing as background music in the background as they're doing whatever they like to do. Um, is there anything specific that you guys use to analyze, you know, how's the pelvic floor doing? How, you know, I know you do internal exams and you have your hands to really be sensory for, for, for figuring that out, but are there any other devices that um, you guys use that, that help you get a sense for what might be happening uh, there? Uh, no, we are not using any devices. No, it would be more a manual approach yeah. um, to really see how the bladder is sitting on that pelvic floor. So you can have them do what we call uh, valsalva, so bearing yeah. down and then lifting up. So you can see how the bladder really kind of floats on the pelvic floor, right? It should, more, it should float. It really shouldn't be pressure down or even lifted heavy, heavily up. Um, so we want to see how it works with the pelvic floor. Right. Um, and so most of it for us would be the, the manual connection um, in terms of assessing the pelvic floor muscular tone and strength and um, the connection with, with really the bladder.
Yeah, yeah. And is there um, anything specific that, you know, you're um, like, like a very difficult case that, you know, you might have had that you had to use maybe some other type of modality to help them along? So you said the TENS unit you sometimes yep, use? Yeah, exactly. Yep, TENS is... Tens. Um, we've we've sent for uh, Indiba laser for some of our patients, particularly the ones who have, if, if more of a superficial, uh, like a dorsal nerve issue. Um, sometimes the Indiba laser can help re really release kind of some of those fascial restrictions and increase blood flow there. Uh, nice. The tens unit would probably be the most most common uh, that we would do laser or tens uh, for. And they modality. go home with that. And they the tens unit, what we do is we ask them that they can purchase it on Amazon, and depending on what their symptoms are, right? So if it's a, it's a primarily a lot of bladder, a lot of urgency, frequency. Well, sometimes we'll ask them to put it along the medial malleolus and your ankle to really calm down that posterior tibial nerve, because yep. that can really calm down some of the bladder upregulation that we're trying to treat. Um, if it's a pudendal nerve, again, depending on where along the distribution of the nerve the issue lies, um, we'll ask them to put the tens. It could be in your buttocks. Once in a while, we'll do it anterior near the pubic symphysis, but classically, it's the buttocks. It's, it seems to be more well tolerated. Um, and we'll ask them to work with their physical therapist in terms of increasing um, the frequency uh, as they start to really improve. So Yeah. So we have a question here. Um, can a woman do a successful pregnancy, have a per successful pregnancy after recto, I think, recto seal repair, um, uterus and bladder okay? Um, that's a great question. I think that would be individual to the patient. Yeah. I would have to, we would have to really take a uh, history and a proper uh, physical exam. Um, but is it possible? I would say it is possible. Um, definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How, however, it really would depend on your baseline level preoperatively and any other what we call predisposing factors to that may make your situation a bit worse, such as um, persistent hypermobility, right? Um, that can really make it a little more challenging to, to have a proper vaginal delivery. So it does depend, but is it possible? It's possible. Right. And, you know, and ultimately, if there is, there are certain things that, um, depending on how large the baby is and how the baby's sitting and how your body tolerates, you know, with support, obviously, um, we could do a lot of things, right? And, and so generally speaking, I think, even if it got to the point of needing a C-section because there was just too much pressure there and you know, just gonna, would have made your condition worse, then, you know, um, I would say, then obviously you can have a successful pregnancy and have a healthy baby. It's just maybe the vaginal birth may be a, a problem. Um, but, you know, ultimately it is possible. And, you know, we have mm -hmm. definitely seen it. But it, like you're saying, it's like it de really depends on the grade and what exactly happened. There's another question. Does a C-section scar have a role in urge incontinence? What's conservative management? That's a great question. Um, mm -hmm. So there has been some data that the C-section scars are connected to what we call ileoinguinal neuralgia. Um, so there is some data saying that it could be connected, but particularly to bladder urgency, not necessarily the incontinence aspect. The incontinence would, would either, would may come from the spastic pelvic floor. Uh, so I would say have a full evaluation. But yes, what we sometimes do is we, we see this a lot actually with the C-section scars and we just do a simple a block on the ileoinguinal nerve. It's not yep. a huge deal and patients really respond well to it. So we see it yeah. quite often. Uh, we, I've, I've had women many years later, like in their 60s, you know, come to me and say, I've got pelvic pain, I've got back pain. And sometimes all I have to do is release. Obviously, if that's going to be the, my course of treatment, I, I, I evaluate the vectors of pull and what's happening at the, the spine and the pelvis. And oftentimes, I will have to go back. And I helped a woman. She was uh, 64 years old and had 20 year history of back pain and her episodes of her back going out, followed by severe posterior pelvic pain. Uh, you know, around the SI joints. And I was like, okay, she needed some stuff in her back. Okay, she needed some stuff in the pelvis. But really, the thing that really made it go away was actually a real, real adhesion and tightness. And that scar was really inhibiting the symphony from playing, right? As we talked about before, it's like, it was just being a, a, a block. 
to the appropriate sequence of events that had to really support her. And she had been in physical therapy and they had just been giving her those exercises, but really her, the rug was being pulled out from under her. Even though she was doing all this great work, it wasn't really manifesting uh, to the result that she wanted because ultimately that scar had been affecting her so poorly that she couldn't get the whole thing to you know really be uh, automatic and, and work in her favor so she was getting these episodic pains so c-section scar is definitely something that i wish you know in certain countries women get 12 visits with a physical therapist to their home or to the hospital or to the birthing center 12 visits after just automatic and women can go and investigate these things and kind of let them know, check this, check that. And, you know, so you can prevent these problems from happening, right? It's, it's like we're it. so, once they come into our office, we can kind of educate them and help them. And just like you do every single day, and then maybe the next, you know, pregnancy, they know exactly what to do, right? Because oftentimes we can't get them at that first one. But, um, but it really is about how to prevent these things from becoming problems later, having, clearing it out, and, and really, um, you know, uh, support, getting the body to properly uh, regain all its support. But it takes 10 months after you stop breastfeeding for your ligaments to get back to normal their strength, right? So you have to be careful, uh, you know, for quite some time after, otherwise you are, you know, in a, in a place where you can be more vulnerable, I think, you know. Um, one last question here, do you check with the patient standing up or laying down? And I think that was probably um, to the exam. Um, uh, I will also okay. say, uh, uh, um, I'll hand it over to you in a minute. Um, I, I would say for breathing, we check both. We actually check you when you're laying down because you could access your diaphragm a little bit more easily. So we look at how do you breathe when you lay down. We give you certain strategies for that because it makes it actually easier. We could even invert you so that you even have a more of a chance and less of a barrier. Um, it really helps to relax the pelvic floor and kind of relax the whole system. Um, and then we also do it standing up or sitting up because a lot of people spend a lot of time sitting. So we check that as well. So I just wanted to say that for the breathing part in case that's when the question came in. I'm a little late on this one. Um, and, then, and then Dr. Shikande, what would you say in terms of you know, your physical exam? Do you also look both lying down and standing up yes. or? hundred percent, yes. We'd be evaluating someone's gait, their posture. You have thoracolumbar, lumbar, sacrum, um, you know, mostly those are all standing up. And then you have ask the patient to lie down and, and you're looking at their abdomen, uh, postpartum diastasis recti, um, any carnets where there's any concern for any hernias. Um, and then you do an internal exam, but that's all lying down. Absolutely. Does Botox treatment help an anal fissure? Uh, had one for seven years. I've tried all conservative therapy. So would yeah, Botox po possibly. Help? I mean, that's so we we don't use Botox at as at PRM conceptually because our our protocol is more functional restorative, right? And Botox causes weakness, uh, so we don't we don't use it um, for the pelvic floor. However, the one caveat is I do refer to colorectals um, if uh, anal fissure does persist for col for Botox to treat the fissure. So so my answer would be yes. I um I would either come in and see one of us, a physiatrist, to make sure it's the fissure fissure, or see you know a colorectal to see if Botox is a potentially an option for you, but yes, right. I've referred. Awesome. And then uh, in prolapsed uterus and pregnancy, can a pessary um, be safe to place um, in even in the uh, first 12 weeks? Hmm. First of are you saying postpartum? So I think we're, he we're seeing here that uh, in these irate 12 weeks in prolapse uterus and pregnancy can pessary be safe to be placed in these irate 12 weeks mm, i don't know exactly if you you know um if you want to restate your question we can help a little bit more but i'm assuming that post-pregnancy do we put a pessary in uh right away um and i think we wait a bit um, but can a, a first trimester, okay, she's saying first trimester uh, of pregnancy. Or during pregnancy. Um, that would be a question for your OBGYN. Yeah, it, yeah. it's not common. Yeah. yeah, and you may need to be in different positions, actually. 
um, you know, if you actually have a, a prolapsed uterus and you didn't know it and you got pregnant, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something for your OBGYN to kind of double check. But uh, I do know women who have had certain dysfunctions musculoskeletally and really do need to uh, really adjust their whole lifestyle to be having to take breaks from being upright uh, mm -hmm. with the pressure. Uh, yes. and, and, you know, we do want you to still be able to move. But, you know, there is definitely something to be said uh, uh, about the idea that when you do actually have an active uh, dysfunctional state uh, internally, how you will need a little bit of extra help um you know along the way you know Definitely. um oh this has been so fun i can't believe it the half hour's up um but <laughs> thank you thanks so much um, patricia thanks yes, for having absolutely. me absolutely it's such it's such a wonderful thing to see your face again and we used to be so close to one another oh, <laughs> i know i, I know. all your team and it's lovely and um hopefully uh you know we'll we'll be able to continue to to do this again and you know come up with fun topics and things like that but you know for the community out there there's a lot of stuff that's in the book that you can help and then uh dr shrikande has pelvic rehabilitation and what's the website um, it's pelvicrehabilitation.com. Yep. And, uh, and right here on Instagram, you can kind of follow them uh, as uh, uh, whoever in my community is watching this. And, you know, of course, I'm at Patricia Lattice um, and patricialattice.com. And thank you so much um, for such a wonderful conversation. I wish everybody a wonderful weekend. And, uh, you know, you are wise. And so, you know, <laughs> let's keep that going, right? Sharing that wisdom with the community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Patricia. Take care. Thanks so, so much. Bye.